There are times when a sermon, however faithfully or carefully it has been prepared, becomes simply not the right sermon to address the magnitude of the moment. And I'm left in that uncomfortable place today. I had a sermon all researched and written and tightly wrapped enough to call it a day. But as this weekend has unfolded, my earlier sermon did not speak to the terrible events of yesterday just down the road in Charlottesville. And to turn a blind eye to these events or to simply offer vague and insubstantial thoughts and prayers without the deeper wrestling that these events demand of us as people of faith, well, that's to disconnect our worship from the world's struggles or our hearts from the world's hurts. It is to offer a stone in place of bread. It is to say nothing when something, in fact, when anything striving for newness must be said. The church must be a place for difficult conversations. So forgive me for setting aside the more polished sermon for some less perfected but more timely and topical words from the heart. Call it a sermon of a different sort. One with loose threads and raw edges and incomplete thoughts, but one that cries out for newness and for justice and for transformation and for peace. And if any of my words ring raw, know that I'm writing in the passion of the moment and then challenge me, correct me, help me to find better words because a proper sermon is a striving together. But thank you for the privilege of trying to speak an imperfect word of response to the unbearable. A worthy first word for today, it seems to me, is a word of outrage and lament. How long, O oh Lord? A car has been driven with malice aforethought into the midst of a crowd of peaceful protesters and innocent blood has been shed upon the idolatrous altar of an ignorant and hate-filled ideology. How long must the powers of evil hold any sway or have any say how long will terrorism, in this instance homegrown, corn pone, heartland American terrorism, stalk democracy? How long will hate speech hide with disingenuous cowardice beneath the protective mantle of free speech? How long will legal, legally permissible speech be permitted to masquerade as morally acceptable speech? How long must we endure racism, which is all too alive and all too well? How long must we strive to remove the tares of hatred from your righteous harvest of love, O God? And how long must we accept that what our politicians, our pulpits and our people, our churches and our citizens fail to actively condemn, we passively condone? It is unbearable, it is insufferable, it is wrong, O oh God. We cannot endure it. We seemingly cannot correct it. So God, against all odds and against our nature, make us new. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Act swiftly, O oh God, of our hope. The prayer that's supported by the long-standing biblical tradition of lament. But as much as I honor the biblical tradition of lament, as much as I value calling out to God for newness and for God's transformation, I suggest with the shameful events in Charlottesville in view, with the blood-stained ground crying out in outrage as when Cain slew Abel, it is first and foremost a time to call upon ourselves for newness guided by God but refusing to throw up our hands and to confess defeat to our collective worst impulses or our fallen natures. It feels cowardly to leave all of the heavy lifting to God when God has called us to repentance and to renewal and to transformation. So let's confess. 
we as a nation are divided. We are partisan and self-interested. We are subject to deep and pernicious prejudices. We have given hatred a safe haven. Our unity is counterfeit, our solidarity is broken, our righteousness is manufactured and insubstantial, our sense of occupying the moral high ground is bankrupt. Our national pretensions of greatness, of exceptionalism, of superiority are suspect. We are the events of Charlottesville, O oh God. And Charlottesville is in part of our making, and we repent. In thinking of the broken division of our nation this weekend, I thought first of the two greatest commandments as lifted up in the teachings of Jesus. Recall our scripture lesson for the gospel of, from the Gospel of Luke. Just then, a teacher stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. This, it seems to me, sets before us a simple but not an easy solution. I'll say that once again. It's a solution that's simple but not easy. It's simple in the sense of being readily grasped, readily repeated. Just two required acts. Love God entirely and love your neighbor as yourself. The not easy part comes in the daily living of it. Recall that as this interaction plays out in Luke's gospel, the man who is testing Jesus responds with a question, and who is my neighbor? A parsing, a qualifying, a mealy-mouthed, weasel-worded response, who is my neighbor? It's a way of asking, and where does the commandment stop? Or in other words, who is not my neighbor? What difference, what distinction is a bridge too far? And Jesus responds, as we know, with the parable of the Good Samaritan. I preached on it not long ago, and I pointed out that the parable of the Good Samaritan is not merely a story urging us to be kind to strangers in need. Instead, Jesus responds to the lawyer's question with a challenging story whose hero comes from the class of people that the lawyer would without hesitation call deplorable, unlovable, untouchable, godless, and godforsaken. In short, the parable is a call to act lovingly across every difference or distinction and across seemingly irreparable rifts. And that, well, that is the lifelong, ongoing, heavy lifting that our faith calls us to. This living with people who aren't like us, it isn't easy. In fact, if we think of it, much of the New Testament, most of the New Testament is comprised of the Apostle Paul's impassioned urging toward the hard work of loving across the rifts and across the differences of human existence. We might note that the frequency of that topic in Paul's writing speaks to the universality of the struggle and also to the difficulty of the task. He calls for the church to be a place where unity is nurtured and where community is born. In Galatians 3.28, Paul writes, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one. All of you are one. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. 
hear well those words. They mean that within our walls, within our community of faith, within our body, there is to be no hierarchy of race or religion, neither Jew nor Greek. There's to be no hierarchy of social or economic class, no slave or free. There's to be no hierarchy of gender, no longer male or female, and I'm going to extend that to gay, transgender, and non-binary. In simple words, there is no safe harbor within our body for isms of any sort. Not racism, not sexism, not classism, not nationalism. Only oneness in Christ and only an earnest commitment to loving neighbor as self. Elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, Paul seeks to address the matter of unity amid difference within the community of faith by using the image of the body, specifically the body of Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we hear the repetition of the thought. And we are all made to drink of one spirit. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, Paul writes, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No part is insignificant or valueless or dispensable, Paul urges. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Unity, community, unity, and community. The writer of Ephesians, perhaps Paul or perhaps another writer familiar with the teachings of Paul, enlarges upon this same body imagery, writing, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Through constant exhortation to the church across many different communities and settings, Paul teaches that the church is to be a place where difference is valued where people are honored, where divisions are healed and love is shown. We learn that here. We struggle with that here. We live that here. We commune here. We converse here. We connect and we correct here. We teach our children that here. And then... Well, then the real work begins. Spread that sort of love. Carry that message forth. Take it to the streets. Show it to the world. Tangibly and where needed, prophetically. Spreading the love means opposing the hate. This, I think, is where the church needs to rise and bear witness. We are called to grow up in every way into Christ who is our head. And Jesus was unafraid to call a brood of vipers a brood of vipers. Vipers inject and spread poison. 
and the white supremacists who came to Charlottesville this weekend came to inject and spread the poison of racism. Not to celebrate heritage, that could have been done in an entirely different way. Not to lift up free speech of anything other than the vilest sort. They came emboldened by our current climate and they came with torches and they came with weapons and they came with an agenda. And for me, one of the most powerful images of the weekend was the silent witness of the faith community. Robed clergy and faithful laity of every denomination linked arms and walked out into the hate with courage and conviction. And they didn't shout. And they didn't meet anger with anger or hate with hate. And they did not become the evil that they were there to deplore. They showed up to meet the anger and the hate and to stand in opposition to it. And to those who would say that to show up, to bear alternate witness, to stand down evil with love is to in some way incite conflict, lift up the words of Martin Luther King Jr. from his letter from a Birmingham jail. We who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out into the open where it can be seen and dealt with. Like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and to the air of national opinion before it can be cured. That's our only acceptable response to Charlottesville, people of God. Name the hate. Expose the injustice. Lift the light of human consciousness and purify and clarify and rectify the air of national opinion until it is fit to breathe again. One of the things I value about our Presbyterian heritage is that we're a confessional church. And that is to say our denomination has as a part of its constitution a set of faith statements written at different times and in different places across the ages and throughout the history of the church. These confessions set forth what we hold dear. Our most recently added confession is the Belhar Confession from the church in South Africa, a place rife with its own history of racism and division. And in part it reads, We believe that God has revealed himself as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God in a world full of injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute and the poor and the wronged. That God calls the church to follow him in this. For God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. That God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind. That God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows and blocks the path of the ungodly. That for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering. That God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. That the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering or need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That the church, as the possession of God, must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and with the wronged, that in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and the privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Therefore, 
we reject any ideology which would legitimate forms of injustice and any doctrine which is unwilling to resist such an ideology in the name of the gospel. We believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and to do all these things, even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them and punishment and suffering might be the consequence. Jesus is Lord, the confession concludes, to the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. We are the church. We lift love to the world. We name and oppose hate in the world. We lift love to the world. Amen.